welcome. So if you haven't already, just uh, if you want to download a set of handouts for, for the session today, you can go to the upper left-hand corner where it says File, and then click on Transfer. Only one document should come up, come up the handouts. Just click on that document and say Download. And it's a Word doc. You could either print it or you could just open it in your computer and work on it there. So I think with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am going to uh, record this so it will be available for others to look at in the future. We've got enough folks that we will do breakout sessions, and it doesn't record uh, you in the breakout sessions. So know that your dialogue in the, in the breakout sessions is, is not recorded. Um, I am going to go ahead and just sort of mute everyone. That helps um, with the recording. Um, if you're, I'm going to give a little bit of background on WebEx. If you're not familiar with WebEx, it's pretty straightforward. I think we've all been using various systems as of late, so we get used to it. If for some reason you have problems with the audio, you can collect on the connect, click on the little three dots down at the bottom, and then click on Connect Audio. And really, if your audio over the internet is not working well, the best option is just to have it have it call you. You can put in your telephone number and the system will call you, and that works pretty well. We will also be using a chat box, um, which you should be able to see on the bottom of your right uh, panel at the bottom. And um, when you chat, just you can chat to individuals if you want to talk to somebody. But in some of our exercises, if you want to just make sure it's set to everyone, and then type your message in the box and hit return, and it'll it'll go out so we can all see it, and that'll be great. Um, a little bit about uh, who I am. My name is Jay Otto. I'm a researcher for the Center for Health and Safety Culture. The Center for Health and Safety Culture is a part of Montana State University, and we're really an interdisciplinary group. We have a wide variety of backgrounds on our team and amongst faculty members, and our work is really about serving communities and organizations, um, doing research, but we also think it's extremely important to bring the research and the results of the research and the things that we learn out to folks doing the work, like yourselves. So we do a fair amount of training and what we call guidance, and it's all in the context around improving health and safety and looking at it through a cultural lens. We work on a variety of issues. Today we're going to be focusing on traffic safety but we also work in other domains. And it's just interesting to see how these other domains uh, address um, health and safety, how they're similar, and how they're different. And often at the community levels, when you start working with coalitions, um, they may work on multiple health-related issues. So the coalitions may overlap. So we really like working in a, in a variety of different issues. But today we'll be focused on traffic safety. This is a quick map of our projects, although we're located uh, at Montana State University. We do work all over the country. I'm actually a remote employee, so right now I'm calling, uh, talking to you from Maryland. I live on the East Coast. We actually, our staff are across the country, um, but we do projects all across the country. We've done a couple of projects in Canada as well. I want to take a moment just to thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, but also to take a moment and thank you for the work that you do. Um, I really uh, think health and safety and improving the health and safety of, of our communities is some of the most important work that we can do. It's very difficult work. At times it's extremely um, challenging work. And I just want to thank you for engaging in, in that uh, important work. What I'd like to do now is just have us connect and me connect a little bit with you all, if you can very briefly describe your role in the chat window. So this is something that you'll then be able to see from everybody else. If you want to go to that chat window in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, make sure you send the message to everyone, and then just type in how you would describe your role. You can, you can use it in terms of your formal title, or you can describe it informally with what you do. Um, but if you could go ahead and do that, put that in the chat message and share that out with everyone. While we're doing that, also if you, if you arrived after we got started, there are handouts that you can use. And to get access to the handouts, you want to go to the upper left corner of your WebEx screen where it says File, and click on File, then click on Transfer, 
and it should open up a little window and click on the handouts and then say download. So file, upper left hand corner file, transfer, and then pick the handouts and say download. You can print those or just open them in Word. So if you want to go ahead and put in the chat message, do you have access? I'm not seeing anything come up on the chat message yet. Can anybody, everybody take a moment and describe your role? Great. Here they come. So Target Zero Managers, AAA Foundation, or AAA Washington. Policy research, safe kids, right? All sorts of aspects around traffic safety and safe kids. Super. Transportation planner. Yes, okay. So recognizing, a little slow to recognize some, some names there. So some folks working on um, traffic safety and driving training and all sorts of good stuff. Great. Well, thank you for sharing. We'll use the chat window as a way to share. We'll also do some things where we're going to break into some small groups for some conversations. So I really appreciate your engagement um, just in terms of introducing yourselves a little bit. So our purpose today is to look at three lessons that really support growing a positive traffic safety culture. And it's interesting. I've been doing this work for um, – close to 20 years, and have been reflecting on these lessons through many of those years. And it's just interesting how I see these three lessons pop up in so many different circumstances and in so many different contexts. And they just, they just really transcend issues. They transcend whether somebody's working at the federal level or a state or a local level. So I hope you you take a deep dive and think broadly about these. Um, they might seem simple, but I think they're very powerful nonetheless. And um, they're just something that, that is helpful to tuck in your back pocket and carry around with you as you're working uh, on different aspects of, in this case, growing positive traffic safety culture, or just efforts in improving health and safety. We use the term traffic safety culture, so I want to provide some definition around it. This is the definition that we use at the center for defining culture. We do not claim that this is the only definition of culture or even the right definition of culture. It is a definition of culture. And we view it as the values, assumptions, and beliefs shared by a group of people <clears throat> that influence behaviors related to traffic safety. So you can see that's, that's very broad. There are many groups of people that influence traffic safety behaviors, from drivers to other road users to law enforcement, policymakers, NHTSA, coalitions, all sorts of groups can engage in different behaviors. And those groups have different shared values, assumptions, and beliefs that form a belief system, and that will influence the decisions that they make. And we view bro broadly as traffic safety culture as the collection of all those beliefs and how do we start to grow those beliefs that are supportive of better and safer behaviors. We're not going to dive deep at all really into the definition of culture, but I just wanted to create that little bit of a context as to how we view and approach culture at the center. So if you've got your handout, there are places on the handout where you can write some things in. I'll key you in as we're going for that, either write them in or type them in. Um, and there's a lot of space where you can also just take notes and, and write down reflections. So let's jump right in. Our first lesson that we've learned at the center over the years is the need to raise concern and hope. So let's Let's first label or define what we mean by these terms, talk a little bit about why, and talk a little bit about how. So just a, a dictionary definition of concern I think is really valuable. Concern meaning it's something that has an influence on us, or it could be something that 
that we care about or are distressed about. So, you know, the problem concerns us all or her health concerns me. And I think we, we're pretty comfortable with this. I think if you're doing this work around traffic safety, you've recognized the need to raise concern. You probably do this all the time and in different ways, but it's still nonetheless valuable not to lose sight of the need to do this and to talk a little bit about how we might do this. So quite straightforwardly, I think why we need to raise concern is because we need people to engage, right? We need, we need drivers to engage. We might need parents to engage. We might need um, pedestrians or other road users to engage. We might need elected officials to engage, law enforcement, all sorts of different folks, but we need them to be focused on the task. Obviously, everybody has a lot of demands on their time, a lot of issues that they're concerned and drawn towards. And if we're trying to, our focus is on growing, uh, improving traffic safety and traffic safety culture, we've got to get them engaged around that. So we're gonna use concern about something as a mechanism to help get people engaged. It's not the only way, but it is, it is an element that we've gotta have them connect with some degree of concern. And rightfully so, as you all know, in terms of the data, traffic safety is a major public health issue. Glad this past year, 18 months, we've been faced with another public health issue around the pandemic. It had devastating effects. And it was interesting to see how the country was able to muster resources and engage and focus on it. And we continually to see, you know, 40,000 people every year die from uh, in, in traffic related crashes. And so it, 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 it traffic safety and, and numerous more injured, traffic safety is a major public health concern. But it's interesting when we think about this work of raising concern that there are multiple strategies to do it. And this often happens sometimes in health related concerns is that we use uh, what we might call as almost a, a fear approach or a very dramatic approach to get people engaged. So this is a picture of a, like what might be a mock car crash, right? This is often done at, a, not often, but sometimes done at high schools um, sometimes done around prime time to sort of decrease um, impaired driving, distracted driving maybe, to show what can happen and, and, and create the perception of, of somebody who's, who's been seriously injured or even died. But what I'd like you to think about and, and put into the chat window is what do you think is the difference between concern and fear? So what is happening both cognitively in people's brains, but also how would you describe the difference between concern and fear? So go ahead and put that in the chat window. You can also take notes on that on your handout if you are on a sheet of paper, but what do you see as the difference between differences between concern and fear? Fear is impulsive. Concern is more thoughtful. Concern can motivate people. Fear can paralyze people. Concern is more considered, right? Fear is immediate and visceral. Thought versus emotion. So all great insight. We often think of like in the brain, concern tends to be more frontal lobe, higher order thinking. Fear can be deep down in our brain, what might be called the limbic system, where, where we are just reacting. And there are times when we need to be afraid. Like there are times when we need to act out of fear. If we're standing in a road and a car's coming down us, we should be afraid, we should immediately run. But on many of the issues and the behaviors that we're trying to grow amongst people, let's say grow among parents to, to establish guidelines around safe driving, or in workplaces to establish and train on policies, we don't necessarily want them working out of fear. We really want them working out of concern. And it's interesting to note, sort of fear can really have some unintended adverse effects. There's no question that fear can motivate people to action. The question is, how do you deal with the unintended adverse effects 
which can sometimes even have a boomerang effect and, and, and come back to sort of make things worse later on. So some of the adverse effects that have been noted in the research is that fear can label and stigmatize. It can expand social gaps, so it can create this difference between you or somebody out there engaging in a behavior and everybody else. And expanding social gaps can make certain problems much worse, specifically around substance use disorders or things like that. And fear can sometimes unintentionally promote poor health as a value. So it's noted that, that some campaigns that have been heavily funded by private or public entities and using fear as an approach can actually make things worse. And some of the evaluations show that they had no impact or sometimes they made things even worse. We can also see fear appeals having, you know, these unintended uh, tangential uh, reactions in terms of stigmatizing, which can then really have uh, problems in terms of getting folks into treatment or getting resources or other, or other things that they need. I think this is a great quote from Miller. Humiliation, shame, guilt, and angst are not the primary engines of change. And ironically, such experiences can even immobilize the person, rendering change more remote. And we know that sort of people who are using fear don't want these outcomes, that their intentions are good. It's these unintended consequences that we're mindful of. So this is just a little bit a brief discussion about how, yes, we need to raise concern and we need to understand maybe the differences between concern and fear. Now let's take a moment and shift and talk a little bit about hope. This isn't something that we talk as much about. We're often very used to this notion that, yes, we need to raise concern to get people engaged, but what, why would we need to do something around hope? Well, let's first define what we mean by hope. Hope is a word that that sometimes people can have a sense of that it's, it's, it's sort of just a feel-good word or don't worry, be happy. We don't look at hope that way at all. And we use this definition from Snyder, which is very academic, but we use it intentionally to show that there's a lot of research and a very rigorous definition around hope. So it's this perceived capability to derive pathways to desired goals and motivate oneself via agency thinking to use those pathways. I think easier said, it's the willingness to move forward and seeing a path forward. So a willingness and a way. And this just becomes extremely important because if we get folks engaged through concern, we wanna give them a direction to go. We want them to take appropriate action, not inappropriate action, but appropriate action. So we need to raise concern, get them engaged, and raise hope. So why raise hope? Because we need directed engagement, not just any engagement, not just jumping in and trying anything, but directed engagement. And we need to, we need to help give them a path, a, a way to make things better. And hopefully we're deriving that from, from the science, from our best research, other, other resources, you know, the evidence-based strategies that we can know and use, but we need that, we need to in, to direct that engagement. It's also important to recognize that the issues we're, you're dealing with, we're dealing with, are extremely complex and are not going to be addressed overnight. So this issue of raising energy becomes extremely important because we're gonna need energy to sustain the efforts to sustain the work. And that becomes an extremely important element. We can see groups that have been working on things and just lose energy. And so how do you sort of keep a group energized and moving forward and that sense of hope can help do that? So what might this look like? Well, I mean, if we, if we just get very practical and very specific around a, a, a traffic safety behavior like wearing a seatbelt, we could think about putting messaging of, out about most people using a seatbelt as an element of growing hope. This element that, hey, this is a really important traffic safety behavior, and there is hope because a lot of people are already doing it. That, that this was a really interesting piece we saw when we were working on a project to grow seatbelt use in rural communities, and it was that most people wanted people they care about to use a seatbelt. 
even people who didn't use a seatbelt themselves wanted people they cared about to wear a seatbelt. Now, that's a really hopeful belief that gives us a sense of a will to be able to move forward on something like this. And even a notion like most people agree it's the driver's responsibility to ask others to use a seatbelt. Well, that's a great place to begin, and we could leverage that to then get drivers to actually do it. Just because they think they're responsible doesn't mean they're actually doing it, but we could begin raising hope around that by just echoing out or bringing forth this belief. So these are just simple examples, but I want you to see is that this notion of raising hope can look like a lot of different things. Um, as, as easy just as bringing out some of the data and help people see that it is possible. This is something we can do. At the center, we really think this is absolutely critical, and especially when we're taking a cultural approach. When we're thinking about traffic safety through the lens of shared values and beliefs of groups of people, we want to take an appreciative lens. We want to recognize the positive that exists and focus on growing it because we want culture to be inherently protective and good, and that's the element of culture that we want to shine a light on and grow. And I think it's related to this quote by Frankel, who said, if we're going to bring out the human potential at its best, we must first believe in its existence and its presence. So if we really think about growing traffic safety and traffic safety culture, it's really connecting back to that notion that it exists. All right, what I'd like to do is to break us into some small groups for a brief conversation. I'm going to divide you into groups of three or four so that it's, it's small, so that you can have a fair amount of talk. I'd like you to introduce yourselves, and then I'd like you to talk with others specifically about ideas that you've used to raise concern and hope. If you to address multiple issues, you can talk about multiple issues or you can pick one, but really sort of lean into this notion. And, and in particular, it might be that you're, you're good at raising concern, but maybe you don't have as many examples of how you raise hope, or maybe you do, but talk that through and share ideas with other folks who are in your group. So this is your question. It's also listed on your handout if you have it. If you don't have a handout, just jot it down real quickly because I'm going to shift screens here to, to assign you into groups. So how do you raise concern and hope? And we're going to give you about, uh, about nine minutes to have this discussion. So now I'm going to put you into uh, breakout sessions. We'd like to do about, um, yeah, I think we'll do three groups. I'll assign them automatically. So you're going to have something that pops up that says to join your breakout session, just agree to that. Once you get into the session, you can come up you can come up and show your camera if you want. It's up to you. Introduce yourselves, engage in that conversation, and then we'll come back in about uh, eight to nine minutes. So welcome back. I always know the, uh, the process for doing these breakout sessions, when you sort of come back, it's a very violent process. It's not like if we were together in the room, you sort of walk around and slowly come back, but with the uh, WebEx, it just sort of jerks you right back to the main group. Um, so this is just an, it's an interesting idea, this idea of raising concern and hope. And I think it seems straightforward, but I would encourage you in your work just to look at opportunities when things might be stalled or you feel like things are stuck and just ask the question, who, do, do we need to raise concern here? Do, do, do the folks who I'm trying to work with really get the concern? And do I need, is, is there a lack of hope? Do, are, are folks not having a sense of a will or of a way to move forward? Do we need to add some more guidance or, or fill in some of the gaps there? It's just interesting uh, to ask that question in different circumstances and see how often that raising concern and hope might, might help foster greater uh, directed engagement. All right, so I want to shift a little bit and, and look at our second lesson, which is around embrace learning. Now, this too seems like it's awfully obvious, like of course we're going to need to embrace learning, but I want to I want to go a little bit deeper here, in particular in, in thinking about traffic safety. First, let's, 
let's look at what might be a definition of learning. And there's lots of forms of learning. I really, when I, w when I read this definition by Peter Singhi, who, who is the author of the, you know, the, the five disciplines, or the fifth discipline, I thought it was just a really interesting definition. So it's some process over time that enhances our capacity to do something that we really want to do. Just like a very straightforward definition. So let's think about that. A process, so we think about learning as a process, it takes time, it's growing our capacity, and it's around something we really want to do. Well, clearly, all of you, I think, really want to improve traffic safety, as will people on coalitions and, and, and the folks working on this issue. But thinking about the learning as a process over time, sometimes I think we think about learning as like, well, I've got to go read something or study something. But thinking about it as a process over time, I think, widens it out. So why might we really think about embracing learning on traffic safety? Because really, the traffic safety challenges we face are complex. 90% in the, in the U.S. and even higher in Washington of folks wear their seatbelts. And yet, that, that remaining percentage who don't, one, it causes a lot of harm, right? We know unbelted fatalities and unbelted serious injuries are a major chunk of fatalities and serious injuries. And we know that reaching this last group is just going to be a lot more difficult than, than the already 90% we got. There are a lot of issues going on. As are if we start thinking about impaired driving. This is, this is not a simple challenge to face. Even, even distracted driving is a very complex challenge because there, there are so many seemingly tangible benefits of engaging in some of those distracting behaviors that it's going to be really hard to have people choose not to engage in some of those. So it's important to recognize that traffic safety, and especially where we are, it's going to be very challenging and complex to get to zero. This is not a simple problem. So it's also valuable to sort of bring some thinking about challenges to this conversation to motivate embrace learning. And this is, this is some work out of the notion that not all challenges are the same. This is on the handout as, as we're bringing up on the slide, but it's this recognition that we can broadly categorize challenges as two types. Those challenges which are technical. That means the problem and the solution are clear. They may not be clear to us, but they're clear to someone. Then often the work is about how do we do it better? How do we, do, how do we get from problem to solution faster, cheaper um, for everybody? And it, it can very much involve positional leaders or authority. P people can say, you know, you've got to do this and sort of tell people and then through various mechanisms make this happen. Many of the, the, the challenges we may face are technical, and this approach is, is very appropriate. What's important to recognize is that not all challenges are technical. Some are what we call adaptive. Adaptive challenges are where the problem and the solution are not clear. They may involve many stakeholders, we can't just have one stakeholder declare what the answer or the solution is and therefore it happened. And they absolutely require learning because we don't know how to solve these. If we try to take an adaptive challenge and approach it like a technical challenge, we tend not to be successful because we plow forward trying to define the problem, saying this is the solution, and then we just blast forward with it, and lo and behold, it doesn't, it doesn't make things better. So adaptive challenges are very hard because we have to hold the fact that we may not, we don't know what the solution is, and that we're going to have to hang out in that space. 
Now, when we think about Senge's definition of learning, which is going to be required for an adaptive challenge, it's interesting to think about it as even a simple model like this. We might plan around something, we might do something, and then we might reflect. And he is a big advocate of this style of learning. Like this, this learning, I mean, you could say book learning is like this because you're going to plan to, let's say, read a book, you're going to read the book, and then you're going to reflect on the book. So there is a form of that. But even more so in the efforts where we're going out and we're trying countermeasures or strategies with folks, I think all of you in your work are very good at planning and doing. And you may be strong at reflecting. I don't know. But that's where the learning really occurs. And so this notion of thinking about embracing learning by intentionally adding reflection to our process is so important. I recently read a study, it's a part of a project, it hasn't been released, it's a part of an ongoing project, but we're looking for all the evidence-based strategies to improve rural traffic safety. And the researcher identified a thousand articles that talked about rural strategies to improve traffic safety. And only 5% of those 1,000 articles had laid out a theory of change for how they thought the strategy was going to result in the outcome. And a theory of change is just sort of a critical piece to help us do the reflection to think about how what we're doing might actually get us to where we want to go. And, and of those 1,000 articles she reviewed, a handful, an extremely small number, actually had any sort of evaluative components to them. So the reflection was just not there in these articles. So I think it's often a missing piece, and it's just so important for us to think about it as we think about this idea of embracing learning. So what might reflection look like? Well, it could be very practical, sort of how was the strategy or countermeasure implemented? Like, are we really asking that question when we go out and we do strategies? We might think we know how it was implemented. We might think we know how it was supposed to be implemented. But was it actually implemented the way we thought it was, and was that the way it was designed or planned? And how do we know? What worked and what didn't? Not only in the implementation, but in terms of, of seeing some impact. Do we have the space to ask that question and really lean into that and qualify how well we know or don't know? Did we see traffic safety improve? Like, did we see, could we see improvements from the strategy or countermeasures that we sought to do? And the very important question, were there unintended consequences? Things that happened that we didn't intend to happen. Maybe good, maybe bad. But are we even looking under that rock to sort of see what were the unintended things that maybe happened? These are not necessarily easy questions. And sometimes our funding doesn't allow us to ask these questions. But nonetheless, how do we lean into embracing learning by thinking about how we could ask these questions, even if it's just starting to ask these questions in small chunks, so that every time we plan do, we have an opportunity to reflect. And we've started to gather some information that we can really reflect on so that the next time we plan, we're actually planning with more wisdom than the last time we did. And we're doing with more wisdom every time we go through the plan, do, reflect approach. Now, saying this is a whole lot easier than doing it. And I think we have to acknowledge that a part of what gets in the way of us starting to really reflect on questions like those are some of the internal voices that we may have. We may have voices coming up around judgment, cynicism, and fear. These are three voices recognized by Otto Schirmer. He's a researcher who does a lot of work 
with communities and organizations about embracing change and sort of leading into the future. And, 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 and he has a process called Theory U, where you sort of go down into what you're all about and then come back forth in terms of a new way of being. And what he's recognized in his work is that the leaders who are leading this work really have to meet and master these enemies because if these voices get too loud, it can really inhibit their ability to lead efforts forward. You all are leaders. Like, you all absolutely are leaders. You might not feel like you have a title of leadership, but you are leaders because you're engaged in this work of improving traffic safety, which a small number of people across the country are, are doing on behalf of lots of other folks, right? They're seeking to lead other folks to a better way of interacting with the, the transport system. So all of us, all of you are leaders. And so it's interesting to think about how these voices can get in the way of embracing learning. I mean, we've had more and more conversations with individuals thinking about how do they start to really evaluate their efforts. And that can bring up some interesting feelings and thoughts like, ooh, is this a report card? Who, who's going to see that report card? What, what's going to be the impact of that report card on, on me and my job and, and, or our funding and, and all sorts of things? So that's where I think it really starts to get critical that we think about these kinds of voices and how they can inhibit our ability to embrace learning. Because I think on face value, all of us would look at it and say, absolutely, we need to embrace learning. I embrace learning. I'm all about that. But then when we really get into the nuances and the details of it and we start asking those difficult questions, these voices can get in the way. So what I'd like to do is to, is to do another breakout session I'm going to mix up the groups, so I think you will be with other folks. And I'd like you to really open up a little bit. This is a tough question, but how do you try to quiet some of the voices that may inhibit you from engaging in reflection, the really, the really tough, hard reflection, the reflection that's getting into, am I really being effective? It, it, are the strategies that we're using effective? Are they being implemented as they were designed? These are tough questions. And how do you, for yourself, quiet those voices that can block or inhibit you from engaging in those? And how have you learned maybe to do that with others as well? So again, we're going to have about a nine-minute period. We're going to have an opportunity after this one to share out some of your thoughts. So think about that as well. And then let's, uh, let's dive into this question. So I'm going to move you into the breakout session. Welcome back. For this one, what I'd like to do is, if you're willing, just stay on camera, and let's just share this out orally. Um, you can take yourself off mute and provide some responses. What were some of the things that you talked about in your small groups? Do I raise my hand or just go? Uh, Doug came up go with ahead. a really interesting idea of adding another voice or another um, issue that can stymie learning, which would be a sense of urgency, that you have a limited amount of time, you haven't planned in advance to allow the time to reflect. And I thought that was really great. That is a great one. Another one that comes up. We don't have time to think about this. We just got to do. Yep. Yeah, I would add to that for people that are on a billable hour basis. If it's not a billable hour, it's probably not going to get a lot of attention. That's a great point. So how do, how do we put in that notion of reflecting and learning growing into the expectations and, and the billable and, and, and what's compensated for, right? Because it's so important in terms of like the challenge of improving traffic safety is, is growing more effective strategies. And so this, this has got to be a, a, a focused investment and it's got to happen sort of where the work is occurring. But that's a great point, Bill.
Any thoughts as the people came up with as, as to how they quiet those voices, not let those voices get in the way? I think a lot of those voices are related to um, your fear of failure or you're being judged about failure or people being cynical about your failure. And so um, being really clear when you're working with other people that failure is totally acceptable and it's a tool that we can use to grow and it's not a character flaw or a reflection of how good or bad a person you are. It's just a thing that happens when you're trying stuff. When you're learning. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> to, to, to add to Two that. people are talking. Oh, sorry. One folk, um, excuse me, you might be on mute. Um, yes, if you unmute yourself, this is under, there you go. Yeah. I was just going to add to, you know, just that failure often happens when you're actually trying to do something really challenging and worthwhile um, that a lot of people haven't done before. And so, you know, failure is part of the learning process. Um, but you know, I think sometimes that has to continue to be articulated to reassure people. And part of that process perhaps is keeping a dialogue going, um, continue to talk to people and kind of find out what they're thinking and, and um, make sure that that sharing continues back and forth. That's a great insight. Good idea. I, I, I was going to... Add, is, it, is it my turn? Um, I, I was going to add um, an, another sort of aspect, or aspect of um, what Doug was saying about the uh, fear of uh, failure. Uh, there's also an aspect of uh, insecurity. Uh, how, how would I put this? That you've wanting to believe you've had a great idea for how to solve this thing. And not wanting to, um, well, uh, yeah, e uh, so a combination of ego insecurity and not wanting to back down or change it, uh, not wanting to do the work to put all these additions in. Um, so, yeah. Exactly. There, there's a lot of vulnerability that is taking place in order to reflect and ask some of those questions. And so, yeah, like all, all those things, how, how it impacts our ego. And it's interesting to see how this comes up at organizational levels, organizations and departments within government can become very fearful of we'll lose our money and different things. So sort of how to navigate all, all that coming up at those high levels. Well, great. I appreciate you engaging in that conversation. I think, we all sort of sense that we need to embrace learning, but we recognize in traffic safety the need to really sort of lean into this heavily. And, and we talk some about evaluative thinking and how to add more evaluative thinking and sort of incrementally all the aspects that we do. Because really when we look at guidance like countermeasures that work or we looked at all the published research, there's just a lot of gaps. There's, there's a lot we don't know. And we've got to start getting better at learning and, and bringing forth and, and, and bringing more evidence around what is, uh, what is effective uh, if we're going to get to zero, because it, it's going to be tough. It's an adaptive challenge. We can't just treat it like a technical problem. Well, great. I've got one more uh, lesson I want to share, so I want to bring that out, but I appreciate you engaging in that conversation. Um, I'm going to just get set up here a little bit. I'm just going to mute everybody. Just helps our quality a little bit. All right. Um, our third lesson is around cultivating transformation. So big words, let's, let's add a little bit of meaning to what, what, what we mean by this. So first off, it's interesting just to, to go back to the metaphor of the caterpillar and the butterfly to think a little bit about change. We like to think about change kind of in, in two broad forms. Simple change, which is like a small caterpillar growing into a big caterpillar. The caterpillar is changed. We can measure that change really well. We can put the caterpillar on a scale, and we can measure exactly how much it's grown, and it can go backwards. The big caterpillar can, can lose weight and become a small caterpillar, so we can measure and it goes both ways. And that kind of change is important. There's another kind of change that takes place as well, 
which is often called transformation. And this is change of form. And in our little metaphor here, it's when the caterpillar transforms into the butterfly. That's a different kind of change. The world of a butterfly is completely different than the world of a caterpillar. It's almost hard to measure this kind of change because the whole form has changed. And so the rules are completely different. So this is often sometimes hard to measure. Um, and it also doesn't happen overnight. We, for the caterpillar, it goes through that chrysalis stage or the ooey-gooey phase where it's literally dissolving and coming forth as, an, as another critter. It's interesting to think about these two kinds of change and to think in particular about the notion of transformation. And for individuals, of course, we don't change our form, but when you talk about individuals transforming, what changes are their mental models, the way they see the world? And just like the transformation of a caterpillar to a, bu a butterfly is one way, it can't go back, typically when people change their mental models, they're changed for good. They don't go back to the way they were. Now, they might change yet again, but they don't revert back to the way they were. It's sort of this, this one-directional change. And an awful lot of work around changing our mental models is around challenging core assumptions. This does not make people comfortable. When you challenge people's core assumptions, they become very uncomfortable. So just like the caterpillar goes through the ooey-gooey phase to become the butterfly, people will go through an ooey-gooey phase when they are challenging and re understanding their assumptions. And that can look, people can look very frustrated, they can become angry, all sorts of different emotions can come out when you start to challenge people's assumptions. It's also interesting to note that when we think about transformation, I can't transform anyone but myself. So if I'm seeking to transform others, I have to recognize I can't do that. But what I can do is cultivate transformation. And the garden metaphor is a really good one because I can't make a seed grow. But I can create the conditions that make it more likely that the seed will grow. So as a leader, I can cultivate transformation in others by creating conditions where transformation is more likely to occur. So then it's as a leader getting good at this work of, of cultivating transformation, building these skills to ultimately foster the transformation of others. Now, why would we want to transform others? Well, when you think about examples where we've had tremendous transformation in public health, you can see that changes are much more likely supported and sustained when we cultivate transformation. We've had a huge transformation about smoking. I mean, the story I always use is when I was younger, you know, way younger, you could get on an airplane and you had the smoking and the non-smoking section, right? And I always wondered how the smoke knew to stop at row 20 and not come into row 19 because row 19 was the non-smoking section and row 20 was the smoking section, right? It doesn't make any sense to us today. But at the time, that's how we approached it. We fundamentally transformed how we understand smoking. We still have work to do on it, but there's been just this enormous transformation. We've similarly done that on drinking and driving, although we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of transformation on occupant protection in cars, and we're having more and more of those conversations around concussion prevention. And you can see in some of those conversations, like the conversations we're having now about concussion prevention, that people can get into the ooey-gooey. When you start talking about, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have five-year-olds playing contact football. Well, people say, well, you're just going to ruin the game. You say, well, should we, should we just ruin their brains? So we're having these difficult conversations and people are upset and anxious about it, but it's because we're challenging some core assumptions. 
We're doing that around equity and disparities right now. We're doing some of the Me Too inv uh, movement was around really raising these, these assumptions about what is appropriate behavior in the workplace and are we able to talk about this and all sorts of things like that. So we can see this idea of cultivating transformation can be really valuable to sustain our efforts, especially when we think about it from a cultural lens. Now, what could that look like, you know, really practically? Well, in, in traffic safety, if we go back to some of the, the seatbelt examples or stories, it, it's surprising when we look at some of the folks who aren't wearing seatbelts, just having an assumption that driving on short trips close to home is safer than longer trips away from home. Therefore, I don't need to use a seatbelt. But you know, the statistics would show you're more likely to be in a crash close to home than far away from home. So this is one of those assumptions we may need to explore and challenge with folks. Using a seatbelt is a personal choice. Is it really? Does it impact others? Is there an impact if you're in the vehicle and, and you're seriously injured, maybe paralyzed for life, will that impact others? What about the impact on, on workers' compensation rates, health insurance rates, car insurance rates? Does that impact others? An interesting one among law enforcement officers that we've dealt with, we've got some communities where we're doing work where the law enforcement officers wear their seatbelts less frequently than the communities that they serve, and they say, I can't wear because I can't get out of the car fast enough. Now, I've talked to lots of officers who just say, that's bunk. I can wear a seatbelt, and I can get out of the car just as fast as you can. You just got to practice. But it, 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 that's just a false assumption. And another one that comes up is maybe if I ask someone else to use a seatbelt, they won't do it. Like, if they want to do it, they do it. There's no point in asking. Really? Are we, are we going to give up on asking somebody else to wear a seatbelt or the different ways we can do it? How could we explore that? So those are just some quick examples. I think what we might do with this last question is we're not going to break out into small groups. We're small enough that we can just keep it as a large group. But I'd like you to explore from your lens, and it could be very specific, like I was giving you seatbelt ones, but it could be much higher level, or it could be assumptions that stakeholders have. It, it doesn't have to be specifically about driving behaviors. It could be other behaviors um, uh, that, that we recognize we need to challenge some assumptions around these if we're really going to move forward uh, on traffic safety culture and getting to zero. So my question, reflect on this for a few minutes, what are the assumptions that you think we might need to explore or be challenged? So what do you think some of the assumptions are that we need to explore or challenge? So I'm just going to stop sharing. I'm going to bring us back to the general Brady Bunch view. If you want to pop on camera, you can or whatever. But take yourself off of mute and share some of your thoughts. What are some assumptions that we need to challenge in traffic safety? Oops. Sorry. Stop video. There we go. Um, Pam's had to <laughs> run off, but she'll be back soon. So something um, that I'm seeing in traffic safety a lot is focusing on what people don't want and not focusing on what they do want. And actually, Jay, I'm going to use you as an example <laughs> earlier. You were talking about distracted driving um, rather than focused driving, for example. Right. Um, and yep. I think, and all, all, not not just in the messaging of traffic safety, but also in the data that traffic safety is looking at, they're looking almost exclusively at fatality data, and they're not looking at. Um, well, there's a whole range of other, you know, data sets that could be looked at. Um, in terms of fatality, it's easy to define what a fatality is. It's easy to identify it and it's easy to count it. But it's not easy to define what is safe driving. How do you identify it and how do you measure it? Um, so there's this tendency to, to focus on, on 
the easy stuff, what you don't want, and at, to the expense of actually focusing on what you do want. Shut up. That's a, a great assumption to challenge. Excellent example. Oh, I have yeah, one. Um, so I've texted while driving and I've been doing it for the last five years and I haven't been in a single accident yet. So I must be really good at it. Right. Yep. I've done this forever. I'm, 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 I'm an above average driver. All those sort of assumptions that can come in. Yep. Good. There's the assumption of, well, I guess this is as good as it gets. Kind of, uh, look, we're at 93% with seat belts. Most people don't drive impaired. Only 10% of the population is distracted at any given moment. That's pretty good. That's, let's call this a win and move on kind of a thing instead of uh, where could we be that's even better. That's a great one. Like fatalities and injuries are just a certain level is the price we pay for a great transportation system. I mean, it's just, it's just a cost. We just pay it. We move on. Yep. That's a great assumption to challenge. Yep. I would say um, this, this is definitely shifting in, in certain, certain regions, certain cities, but, you know, I think for decades of focusing on enforcement and education um, that still seems to be the go-to for a lot of people. Um, you know, we can just educate people, we can enforce the laws and we'll solve our problems and, and maybe not that commitment to redesigning our, our networks, uh, cost more money, it's more effort, but that is ultimately what will get us there. And so, you know, bringing people along um, in that, that thinking. I think that's a great one. I think we're right on the cusp of a lot of conversation around what I'd like to see is potentially a conversation where we sort of sunset the E's, the five E's, the four E's, whatever you want to call them, and it's really starting to think about safe systems and safe cultures. And, and that, that you're right, there's going to be some assumptions that, that we're going to have to challenge and let go of there for sure. Um, not, I, I don't want to be a, a, a shameless plug here, but my firm Tool Design, um, check out or just Google the new E's. And uh, we put a lot of thinking into that. Um, the new E's being ethics, empathy, and equity. Um, I mean, they're not, we didn't invent these, but uh, we've just been thinking about that, what you just said, Jay, just moving away from the traditional E's. Yep, we're just so stuck in that paradigm. Great. And I think you raise another great assumption, like, is, is the transportation system equitable? And just asking that question and challenging that assumption, like, it's got huge inequity in starting to look at this. I guess I'm I was going to suggest another one about our American culture is very sleep deprived. And I, I kind of feel like there's something very, um, we're kind of kind of macho proud of ourselves because we think that because we're such hard workers, you know, it's just kind of a badge of, you know, I'm not getting enough sleep. That's because I'm such a hard worker and people who get plenty of sleep must be lazy. And it's, it's just kind of a very weird, um, you know, and it flies in the face of all of the research that's that's been coming out in the last 10 years about how critically important it is to get a good night's sleep every night. <laughs> um, but. Yeah, just to, just to be effective and efficient and wise and all those things, as well as healthy and not crash. And yeah, that's a great one. Any others? Well, one might be uh, something along the lines of if we just got another Got Milk campaign, it, it, we'd solve all our safety camp safety problems. Not realizing the Got Milk program was not successful. <laughs> right. It, it, it's a great assumption, but that is a really good assumption about what makes an effective campaign. 
And the assumption is if everybody's heard it or talks about it or has high awareness, that's a great campaign. Whereas, like, the research is clear, that doesn't necessarily, I mean, you need awareness as a beginning, but there are lots of campaigns like Got Milk that were imitated. It just had one problem. It just didn't raise any milk sales. So, yeah, that, that huge discrepancy is so what, what is effective when we think about communication is, well, think, is a great area of an assumption to challenge. And I think you could add to the industry that assigns awards to these types of campaigns without the idea of how effective they are contributing to the problem. Uh, potentially. Absolutely. <clears throat> yep. Mm. Absolutely. So good. So what I wanted to do here today was just start this conversation with you to have you start to think about this notion of cultivating transformations, tra transformation by challenging assumptions. And I think just merely having those conversations more and more, like what are our, some of our assumptions? What are some of our assumptions we may need to let go of? Just naming our assumptions to be able to start uh, going down this road. So just a little bit more just to tie the pieces together. Some next steps that you might think about doing is just to, to take these three simple ideas and just keep them in their back in your back pocket or, or put them on a post-it note somewhere and just start thinking about how are we raising both concern and hope? Are we doing more of one than the other? Or do we need do we need to bring in some more aspects of hope? Do people have a sense of a will and a way to move forward? What can we do to embrace learning and reflecting for ourselves, for our teams? How do we have those conversations up front to make reflection? I think your comment was a great one. To make reflection a billable hour. Like having that conversation in the proposal stage to say, do you want to learn anything out of this project? Then maybe we all value that. Maybe we need to write that in as something that we need to do and, and compensate for as a part of the work. And then how can we continue to challenge assumptions and cultivate transformation? So I hope you just hold those up and keep them around and bring them out strategically at different times to, to, in, in your work to, 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 to think about ways. And, I th and I've just seen so many opportunities where I think if we, we start to do this, it can help us be more effective in our efforts of improving health and safety. So. If you're interested in any more stuff from us, here's some of our contact information. We're in the midst of doing an overhaul of our website, but our website has lots of a fair amount of information on it and, and a lot of other recorded webinars and, and different resources. Um, hopefully, our paths will continue to cross into the future. I definitely know some of you from the past, and we're going to be doing some work with the Washington Traffic Safety Commission for um, the next the next probably year or so. And so it'll be a great opportunity that hopefully we can interact and engage on more things in the future. Before we um, conclude for the, the afternoon, are there any more questions or comments that you all have? I, I, sorry, it's, uh, let's get the old video going here. Um, I did have a, a comment or question earlier you brought up a definition of learning um and actually could you, have you have you got it there just read it out i can't yeah. remember what it was but it it so i had a, um, learning right here there you go oh yeah uh, some process over time that enhances our capacity to do something that we really want to do what um j jarred with me a little bit is it wasn't um, it wasn't clarifying between um, what a desired outcome is and an undesired outcome is. My mind immediately went to one of my big red flags, which is learning learning from experience. You know, learner drivers, they get their test and then they go out in the roads and learn from experience. That's and, an assumption we want to challenge. Right. That's that's uh -huh. an assumption because invariably what that means is people learn what they can get away with. Um, and that's, that, that can be a very different thing from a desired learning 
outcome. And it, it was just mentioning that that def, for me that definition didn't clarify um, the difference between a desired learning outcome, which an in, the the new driver does want to be able to learn how to do the phone and drive at the same time, as opposed to an undesired um, out. You know um, that uh, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily want them doing that. <clears throat> That's a, that's a great observation, and I think a, a great limitation of that, that definition, so it's a good one. And it's also interesting to think about, I could also see that as aspects of, of subtleties around, around learning and training. So we might, in terms of training aspects, have very uh, intentional and focused uh, and thinking about that, the, the desired learning outcomes we want to achieve. But I think that's a great point to, to bring up as well. And I think Senge is just sort of looking at it in, 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 in a much broader sense. Um, and, and he's pr principally focused also in, in, in a context often around organizational learning. But it's a great comment you make. I appreciate that. Any other thoughts or comments from folks? Well, I want to appreciate your all's engagement this afternoon. I really enjoyed the conversation and sharing some ideas with you. And I look forward to opportunities where our paths may cross in the future. And Doug, I will see you in a few weeks in Spokane. Sounds good. See you there. All right. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much, Jay. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Bye. Excellent. Bye.